afternoon session. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Bill Poo, modeling bar syndrome using patient-specific iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes. He's an expert, in, a clinical expert in uh, stem cell biology. Bill, do you want to use this? Um, I think I'm hooked up. Okay. I'd like to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful meeting. It's a really unique uh, opportunity and a unique meeting. Um, so my lab has studied heart development and particularly transcriptional regulation of heart development. So this uh, area of metabolism is uh, new to me. Um, but I'm also a pediatric cardiologist, and this, uh, I was interested in this uh, disease because I, uh, 15 years ago, uh, as a cardiology fellow, diagnosed a patient with Barth syndrome, and this is his clinical course. His fractional shortening, as with many children, it improved uh, during childhood, almost reached uh, normal, and then plummeted again in adolescence. And uh, it always impressed me that each time I saw him, his fractional shortening would be quite different. It's just uh, uh, this type of uh, waxing and waning course suggests that this is really unlike many, most other cardiomyopathies, which are, uh, always get worse. Uh, this one, it seemed that uh, there should be a way to make the, this better and to stabilize the function in a, in a, in a better state. Um, also, this was a single gene defect, and it's, it seemed that this should be something that um, eventually we should be able to uh, get our hands on. So uh, the other development was that in 2006, uh, Yamanaka published uh, these very uh, well-known papers in which he took uh, fibroblasts, first from mouse fibroblasts, then human fibroblasts, and reprogrammed in them into pluripotent stem cells. And I thought that this would be a great way to model uh, Barth syndrome, which at that time had, uh, there, were, there were no mammalian models. Um, so this is just a schematic of uh, the idea of iPS cells. So you take a patient's, you take a patient's um, fibroblasts, and you uh, treat them with uh, stem cell factors transiently so that they become reprogrammed into uh, pluripotent stem cells. And then these can be, uh, in normals, can be used to study human developmental processes that are otherwise inaccessible. Uh, from patients, uh, you can uh, obtain patient-specific uh, samples that can be used for disease modeling and for development of treatment. And uh, in the future, perhaps, you would be able to uh, use autologous um, re corrected um, samples that could then be placed back in the patient uh, for replacement therapy. So why, why would uh, IPS be a good approach to model Barth syndrome? Uh, first, it's, uh, it would be a human loss of function model uh, that would be useful for disease mechanism and also to look at uh, causes of inter-individual variation. It would be renewable, patient-specific, and, uh, and also relevant for preclinical pre testing. And uh, there's potential for high-throughput drug screening to discover no novel treatments. So this is an outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'll describe how we uh, generated iPS cells from two uh, patients with uh, Barth syndrome, and then how we can differentiate these into cardiomyocytes uh, then I'll uh, describe how we use these uh, induced cardiomyocytes, which I called ICMs, uh, to uh, analyze mitochondrial abnormalities in both the neonatal rat knockdown model and the, and the Barth syndrome um, samples. And then how we use this model to test a few uh, potential treatments for Barth syndrome. So we identify two patients, one from uh, that we call BTHC and another BTHH. Um, with Barth syndrome, one uh, ta had a frame shift mutation in TAS, the other had a point mutation. Um, most of the studies I'll present are from this line because we did it first, uh, but now we've repeated almost all of them in both lines and found consistent results. Uh, we've also initially did uh, reprogramming using a retroviral technique, uh, but now I've done it with mod RNAing, a non-integrating technique. Uh, so the results I'm showing are also not dependent on the pr reprogramming technique. These are just some examples of uh, the uh, reprogrammed cells uh, with a stem cell-like morphology and expression of uh, well-known pluripotency markers like NANOG, SSEA, and uh, OCT4. 
Uh, we also did some quality control with these iPS cells and showed that they have a normal karyotype. And uh, when you implant them under the skin of a mouse, uh, they develop teratomas that uh, uh, represent all three germ layers. So next, uh, we needed to take these cells and differentiate them into cardiomyocytes. So uh, we went to Chuck Murray's lab in Seattle, and we learned his protocol for uh, human, IP, uh, human stem cell differentiation into cardiomyocytes. And essentially, uh, it's done in a matrigel sandwich uh, with uh, five-day treatment with Activin and BMP4 to induce mesoderm and then removal of growth factors and, uh, and uh, then spontaneous cardiogenesis over the next uh, 10 days. And after this protocol, we get about 20% cardiomyocytes. So if we dissociate these, we can show that they express troponin, and um, they also express this cell surface markers, SIRP1A and VCAM, which were recently shown to be cell surface markers of human cardiomyocytes. Uh, this is just a, some movies of what these look like. After major gel differentiation, you get these thick tissues uh, of beating cells. About 20% of these cells are actually cardiomyocytes. And one thing that anecdotally is true is that the control cells beat much more robustly than either of the Barth lines. Uh, we're, we're doing some work now to try to quantitate that. So now we have 20% myocytes, but we'd like to do our studies on more pure samples. So we developed methods to um, purify these cells. Um, so it was recently reported uh, that VCAM is a cell surface marker of, of uh, cardiomyocytes. So what we do is we take the uh, major gel sandwich and we digest with collagenase and do a magnetic cell sorting with VCAM so that we can enrich uh, for the cardiomyocyte population, which is shown here in green. The red is the isotype control. And uh, if you take this uh, sorted population and then refax them to test their purity, so here now we're faxing VCAM versus uh, troponin, you can see almost all of the VCAM positive cells are troponin positive. So the output of this uh, is about 83% pure cardiomyocytes. And uh, we can then replate these cells and stain with uh, cardiomyocyte markers, and they look like nice uh, fetal or embryonic-like cardiomyocytes. They clearly don't have an adult morphology. Um, so next, we wanted to make sure that uh, the samples that were from the Barth patients really had the Barth uh, cardiolipin profile. So here's the control-induced uh, cardiomyocytes uh, with the normal cardiolipin profile. This was done in Vim Kulik's lab. Um, here's the uh, MLCLs, and in the, the BTHH line, we have uh, reduced uh, mature cardiolipin and the in increased uh, composition of the immature form. So next, we wanted to take these uh, induced cardiomyocytes and analyze their mitochondrial function. First, uh, while we were developing these, these Barth lines, we uh, also made a uh, shRNA adenovirally delivered shRNA knockdown model in neonatal rats. And uh, our assay platform, uh, it's been talked about a little bit already, the uh, Seahorses Biosciences Extracellular Flux Analyzer. And we'll focus on these measurements, the oxygen uh, consumption rate. I'll just review a little bit about how this machine works. Basically, it's just measuring oxygen consumption of cells plated in a well. Um, at baseline, you can get the baseline oxygen consumption, and then you add a drug that inhibits the F1 ATPase so that you can divide this basal respiration into the portion that's being used uh, to drive ATP synthesis, and then the other portion that is uh, not being used for ATP uh, synthesis, which is labeled the uh, proton leak. Then you um, treat with a drug that makes holes in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and then you, get, uh, you can get the peak respiratory capacity. And finally, you block the uh, electron transport chain, so then you uh, can find out how much oxygen consumption is not coming from the mitochondria. 
So here's our TAS knockdown model. We made a SHRNA. We actually made uh, three of them. Two of them were effective. Uh, these two were effective, whereas this one usually is not effective. The combination was no more effective than any one by themselves. Um, after three days of uh, treatment with adenovirus, we uh, again sent samples to Vim Kulik, who found, uh, measured the cardiolipin composition. And uh, so this is, you know, the, the total time is only three days. So that means that we, the time for the gene product to go down and the cardiolipin profile to become abnormal is three days. Uh, cardiolipin profile becomes uh, highly abnormal in that time suggesting that both TAS uh, half-life is very low as well as the cardiolipin half-life. We looked at the mitochondrial morphology in this short time course experiment and we found no abnormalities of mitochondrial morphology, both the area, the number. Uh, when we look, do number by uh, mitochondrial DNA to nuclear DNA, we see a little bit of increase. It's about a 1.5 fold increase in the mitochondrial number by that assay. Um, next, we looked at the ATP content, and we saw that it was decreased in uh, the two independent shRNA knockdowns. And then we did the seahorses uh, measurements. And interestingly, uh, the basal oxygen consumption of the uh, knockdown cells was higher than the controls, which was opposite to what we expected. And then if you um, inhibit the F1 synthase, then you uh, see that much of that is being used uh, to drive ATP uh, production, although ATP levels are lower, which means that you're using more oxygen to make less ATP through the ATP synthase. Uh, and you, you also have an increased uh, proton leak. The respiratory reserve was decreased in that, that base, the uh, maximal oxygen consumption was less uh, than the control cells. So um, we did this several times, and this is just a quantitation summarizing what I said, that the basal oxygen consumption is higher. The portion being used to generate the oxygen consumption to generate the lower amount of ATP is higher. The respiratory capacity is decreased so that the reserve is decreased. Now, we also did a measurement of uh, the mitochondrial uh, membrane potential using TMRM. So we uh, treat the cells with TMRM, and then we um, do a fax where we uh, measure the TRM, TMRM intensity. And this, this high-intensity area, these are the cardiomyocytes. So out of this high-intensity area, uh, if you have no, the, the control cells are red. If you treat with a control, shRNA is basically unchanged in green. And interestingly, the TAS shRNA increased the, uh, tra the mitochondrial membrane, potent membrane gradient, which was also opposite to what I might have guessed. And this is just a quantitation again. So this is the ineffective shRNA showing that it did not really change the, tr the TMRM signal, whereas the two effective shRNAs increased the TMRM signal. So putting these uh, results together, um, we have decreased basal ATP, increased basal oxygen consumption, increased basal mitochondrial gradient, and a decreased respiratory reserve. So the way I understand this is that at baseline, the, limit, the limiting factor is uh, the F0, F1 ATPase. Cardiolipin deficiency is making that inefficient so that you, it needs more oxygen to generate less ATP. Um, and at baseline, it is not the electron transport chain that is limiting. Under stress, such as uh, inhibition, um, I'm sorry, such as making holes in the membrane, when you get maximal electron transport chain activity, then you can unmask the, um, the deficiency in the electron transport chain activity. So in summary, uh, this model shows that there's rapid TAS and cardiolipin depletion, showing a short half-life of both. Mitochondrial function abnormalities occur prior to detectable morphological abnormalities. And the primary effect of cardiolipin deficiency at baseline is a limitation of the F0, F1 ATP synthase activity. 
So next, we did a similar analysis using the BARF IPS cells to see how much this could transfer to, to the human model. And actually, everything that I said is, is uh, the same. So at baseline, oxygen consumption is higher. There's a higher uh, use of oxygen to make ATP. There's also a higher proton leak. Uh, it's not shown well on this one, but in general, the uh, respiratory reserve is less, and the uh, oxygen, uh, maximal oxygen consumption capacity is less. Also, ATP content was reduced. And uh, so, again, one of the limitations that, that uh, people doing IPS work now are coming to is, that, is the control. So you have two, uh, a control human sample and a diseased human sample. One difference is the, gen the, the mutation of TAS, but uh, of course there are thousands of genetic differences between those two cells. So we need to know that the difference that we're studying is really due to the gene. So one way you do that is we have two disease samples, not just one. And the second is we did an independent knockdown model using a TAS, so that's a second line of evidence. Uh, but we have a third line of evidence, uh, which is using a new technology to deliver genes to myocytes. So those of you who have done myocyte bi biology know that this has been a limiting problem in, in uh, studying myocytes, is that it's hard to deliver genes to them. You basically need to make an adenovirus to get efficient gene delivery. Uh, but this mod RNA technology will overcome that limitation. And essentially, this is the same mod RNA that's used to reprogram um, IPS cells. So essentially, what you're doing is in vitro uh, transcription of an RNA using 5-methylcytidine and pseudouridine. This creates a modified RNA that can be translated normally but does not elicit the interferon innate immune response. So normally, if you transfect an RNA, it'll kill the cell, but this will bypass that, that uh, problem. So now, what we found is that this, actually Ken Chen's lab discovered this, is that this mod RNA not only is good to reprogram cells, but it is uh, very efficiently transfected into cardiomyocytes. This is an example. These are neonatal rat myocytes that we transfected with a nuclear GFP. And you can see that almost every cell got transfected by nuclear GFP. The other advantage of this technology is extremely fast. You get peak levels. Uh, you get detectable levels within three hours and uh, peak levels within 24 hours. But the disadvantage, it goes away so that by about 72 hours, it's gone. So here we are with that. That was rat myocytes. These are the human induced cardiomyocytes, again, showing efficient transfection. And here we transfected with the flag-tagged uh, TAS. And here we use the mitochondrial RFP viral marker that marked this cell. And in this cell, you can see that the TAS distributes to the mitochondria. So the transfected mod RNA makes a protein that goes to the correct compartment. So now we wanted to ask, what if you treat these induced cardiomyocytes, the BARTH, induced cardiomyocytes, or the control cardiomyocytes with this modified TAS. Here is just the control myocytes, and we uh, transfect with mod GFP as the control or modified TAS. And what you can see is they're pretty much the same. And what that tells you is that high-level expression of TAS in myocytes, is, is, it, it doesn't do anything bad in this assay, which I think is important to know for potential gene therapy applications. Next, we uh, asked what would happen if we tried to reverse the um, BART syndrome phenotype. So again, this is control transfected with, a, with the mod GFP. These are the BART cells uh, treated with the mod GFP. And if we treat with the TAS, it essentially completely corrects the phenotype, um, which on the one hand, you might think that, of course, it will. It's your replacing the gene defect, but first this shows that it's an extremely fast correction, which is important to know for this assay if you wanted to screen for therapy that might um, be useful to correct the TAS defect within the window of this experiment, we can use this as a control to say that we can correct, we can detect the correction. Secondly, it shows that the, the genotype uh, the TAS mutation is the key difference between these cell lines and not the thousands of other genetic differences. 
So uh, this is just a quantitation of these results again, showing that the basal respiration is, uh, this is the mutant, co completely corrected by the modified TAS. The oxygen, uh, high oxygen use for ATP generation is completely corrected, and the respiratory capacity and respiratory reserve are corrected. And we did this with both of the cell lines. So in summary, um, what we found is that these uh, BARTH, uh, the human knockout, uh, human mutant cell lines um, completely mirror the abnormalities we saw in the neonatal mod rat model, that the modified TAS um, confirms the genetic differences. Uh, the differences are due to the TAS mutation, uh, that these defects are rapidly reversible. They provide a control that will allow us to develop assays to screen for therapeutic compounds. And uh, the TAS mod RNA overexpression do doesn't do anything bad, at least in this assay, um, suggesting that tight control of TAS levels may not be important in gene therapy applications. I'll, I'll, before I get asked, I'll also mention that this was the full-length TAS, so it has the, uh, it, it is plus the exon 5, uh, and that was also true in the rat model. So it can rescue the rodent model as well as the human model. Um, okay, so finally just, uh, we, we wanted to show that this model would be useful to look at different uh, therapies for Barth syndrome. And there have been several that have been mentioned at this meeting. Um, there's linoleic acid, which I imagine, although I may be wrong, but I imagine this may be going through this, uh, this pathway to, uh, to contribute to the mature cardiolipin. Um, uh, Michael Schlame's group uh, and others have shown that this mitochondrial PLA2 uh, may, may be involved in increasing the amount of MLCL, and therefore they proposed um, inhibiting that with this drug, bromoenal lacto lactone. And um, Richard, of course, has suggested that uh, high-dose arginine and cysteine may um, be effective in this, in this disease. So here we took the control cardiomyocytes and treated them with these three different uh, um, manipulations as well as with the modified TAS. Um, so what you can see is that the, and here we're measuring ATP content. So ATP content in the control cells was uh, certainly not adversely affected by these uh, manipulations, and arginine and cysteine um, increased the ATP content. In the Barth syndrome cells, uh, modified TAS uh, rescued the ATP content, as did linoleic acid and arginine and cysteine, but the PLA2 inhibitor uh, had no effect. We also, we're also doing the seahorses assay, but we only have uh, some of the results so far. We've, sh we've looked at linoleic acid, which seems to partially, it seems to reduce the baseline oxygen consumption of the cells, but does not fully correct the, um, the peak uh, respiratory capacity. Uh, we've only done this experiment once, I think. That's why the error bars are so large. So in summary, um, we've established a renewable human cardiomyocyte model for analyzing proposed treatments of Barth syndrome. We showed that linoleic acid and arginine plus cysteine supplementation uh, may normalize mitochondrial function in these induced cardiomyocytes. And just as an overall summary, we've taken skin, we made stem cells, uh, we then made myocytes, then we... Uh, did assays for mitochondrial function, and we showed that uh, the mitochondrial function, in, inefficient mitochondrial function, caused low ATP levels and high oxygen consumption with reduced respiratory reserve. There's rapid reversibility of the disease phenotype, and uh, that this may be a useful platform for uh, therapeutic uh, screening. Um, just mentioned that if there's other patients who would like to donate some skin for this, uh, it would be fantastic. I think at this point, the main purpose of this would be to look at inter-individual variation. Um, this would involve a con informed consent and a two millimeter punch, a skin punch biopsy that's done under local anesthetic. So two millimeters is really pretty tiny. 
Um, no sutures require just a Band-Aid. In terms of distribution of these cells, uh, we've already given the low-passage fibroblast to the Barth Syndrome Foundation biorepository, and you can ask Matt how you can get those cells. Um, I would pr propose that the foundation needs to figure out how to prioritize the distribution and also how to expand them so that once they're given out, they won't be gone. Um, then uh, I think there's a similar problem in distributing the IPS cell lines, and I'm trying to, I th I, I'm planning to give them to WeCell, uh, which is a stem cell repository, and I think that they'll be a good, that'll be a good avenue to uh, widely distribute these cells and to have them, if we just give a few vials to the, the repository, they'll just, they'll just be gone, and then it won't be a renewable resource. So I'd like to thank uh, all the people that worked on this. Uh, all, the, all the work in my lab was done by Gong Wang. Um, I'd like to thank Wim Kulik for the cardiolipin assay, Chuck Murray for showing us how to do these uh, cardiomyocyte differentiations. Richard Kelly uh, obtained one of the iPS cell lines, Amy Roberts at Children's obtained the other one. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. So, so you mentioned that when you measure the, the TAS uh, mutant cells, and they have a higher uh, potential, mitochondria membrane potential, right. than normal. Uh, but that one, did you normalize to how much mitochondria in the cell by la uh, a label with uh, like a uh, metal green or something that does not depend. Right, so when we fax using my the mitotracker green, we don't see that uh, difference. So in those graphs I showed, that was the raw data, but wh when we do it with the green, you don't see that difference. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. Yes? It, it's very puzzling actually that uh, the the Potential is increased, you know, because yes. I cannot imagine how that could happen, especially when you show in, in one of your seahorse experiments that the proton leak is actually a little bit elevated. So right. how come you have an increased membrane potential? Well, the way I'm, that's why I'm interpreting that the electron transport chain at baseline is actually not limiting. And I think it's as if you gave the cells a little, F, uh, a little bit of oligomycin. So... Sorry. Okay, so. And in this first phase, this basal respiration, is that in the presence of ADP? We use, we just have the cells in glucose. So yeah. the glucose is the fuel source. So uh, actually, I didn't go over all the things about how we culture these cells. So we culture the cells in uh, a galactose medium so that they're not using gly glycolysis. But then at the moment of doing the assay, we switch them into a glucose-containing medium. Okay. So what I think is if you, in, if you partially, if you make this less efficient, but the electron transport chain is not limiting, then it will actually accumulate uh, an excessive proton motive force to drive the protons. And that's how I interpret the increase in the baseline uh, trans, uh, trans mitochondrial gradient. Um, just, just to add a comment on that, um, we work on another, another cardiolipin remodeling enzyme, uh, which I'm going to present in um, less than a half hour. We, we see the same thing. When you see cardiolipin depletion, you see the um, oxygen, basal oxygen consumption rate go up because they're wasteful. And that's, that's how I, I think what's happening. I think I'll steal since I've got one in my hand. So along those lines, I, I don't know if at your institution there's anyone that has a, a, a respirometer, the Ouroboros respirometer, or some other oxygen electrode. I know the you know, the seahorse is rapidly becoming very, very popular because you can do full, you know, intact cells. You can do glycolytic flux. But to really probe the mitochondrial respiratory chain physiology and doing, like, you know, the classic state three and state four and then uh, these protocols that you can do with that particular instrument, you can really tease out what's going on, if that's an interest, um, which may help with interpreting the data and then getting real understanding of, of, of uncoupling, if we think that's what's going on, as, a, as opposed to just ATP and how much oxygen was consumed and whatever substrates may be in the cells at the time, you know, you can control it more. So it might be, it'd be great collaboration. Yeah. Okay. 
And so I was just curious about um, the oxygen consumption rate you show here without any uh, um, um, galactose treatment to stress, stress the mitochondria. So do you see, what kind of difference do you see in the tafazine knockdown? Uh, so you, you're just saying that uh, those cells you put in the galactose media right. and then switch back to. Right. So if you don't do the galactose media treatment, do you see in? Um, what we see is if we measure their um, use of glycolysis by this uh, extracellular acidification rate, um, we can see that the Barth syndrome cells are using more glycolysis. And so the differences are smaller, um, I think, because they're... they're um, for example, the ATP differences are much smaller because I think they're able to uh, use the increase the amount of glycolysis to compensate for their uh, inefficient um, uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Can I uh, ask um, the, the mod, the TAS mod, uh, why why the persistence only for about three days? Any, any reason for that? Yeah, you're basically transfecting RNA. So as soon as the, there's, it, the RNA goes away and you're not making more RNA, so you can repeatedly transfect, um, which is how you do the reprogramming. And reprogramming, you transfect every second day. Um, but in some applications, that ability to get a very high, short pulse and then have it go away can be very advantageous. Just, uh, yeah, this is it. Uh, how just and uh, how do your bar syndrome uh, cells grow compared to your controls? As stem just, cells or as just in terms of you know culture? How often? I mean, do they divide more, less frequently? Do they take longer to grow? Um, it's a little hard for me to say that because I'm not doing the culturing, but, uh, but um, I know that they differentiate at, a, at about the same percentage uh, turns into cardiomyocytes. In terms of rate of growth, um, I, um, I guess I can't really say, but I think that if they were tremendously different, my postdoc would have mentioned that. Very short question. You know, when I did, you know, when I did transfection before a long time ago for bus cells, three days is not enough for cardiolipine profile change. No matter how hard you did, I use retrovirus. So After 72 hours, I didn't find obvious change from bus cells. Mm -hmm. I want to do gene therapy. Nothing changed for cardiolipine. So same thing for you. How can you, you know, convert normal cells become bar cells? So were those myocytes or not myocytes? And what were you transducing them with? It's very difficult. This is why so, because cardiolipine metabolism very, very slowly. Okay. Um, 